The 1980s in the United States was a decade of economic prosperity and cultural change, where consumerism and materialism were at an all-time high. People had more disposable income than ever before, and the economy was booming. Reagan's leadership and policies favored capitalism, which regained popularity, and Wall Street was thriving. Greed and speculation were viewed as positive means of achieving financial success. Nobody personified this culture of speculation and greed more than Michael Milken. He rose to become one of the top 10 richest people in America by revolutionizing the junk bond industry and funding major deals for figures like billionaire Henry Kravis and corporate raider T. Boone Pickens. This is the story of Michael Milken, the junk bond king. The Early Years of Michael Milken Milken's early life remains largely unknown, as he is known for being highly reclusive. His father, an accountant, provided a comfortable upbringing for his family. Despite losing his hair in his teens, Milken continued to work harder and longer than his peers, famously saying, I don't know if I'm smarter, but I can work 25% harder. Milken studied business at Berkeley and discovered a key financial study by W. Braddock Hickman that showed lower grade corporate bonds offered higher returns with equal risk. This sparked his talent for identifying overlooked opportunities in finance. He later honed his skills at Wharton and started his career at Drexel Firestone, an investment bank. The Rise of a Financial Maverick Milken started as a high-yield bond researcher at Drexel. During the mid-1970s, Milken proposed a high-yield bond department and was given limited capital. By 1976, he generated 100% returns and became Drexel's top employee. Drexel created a junk bond operation under Milken's control with a favorable compensation plan, giving him most of the profits and power to distribute to employees. Disrupting Wall Street Milken's groundbreaking junk bond operation. Milken's bond operation, based in Century City, California, was established in 1978 with a small team of just 15 people. Under Milken's demanding leadership, his employees worked grueling hours from 4.30 a.m. to 8 p.m. The intense work schedule caused work-life imbalance and led to unhealthy behavior, such as drug use, extramarital affairs, and health problems. Despite these consequences, the high compensation, up to five times more than Wall Street, and the potential to earn millions annually attracted employees. Milken and his team targeted fund managers struggling in pension and insurance investment, needing to show high returns to secure new clients and remain in business. Milken took on a significant task by meticulously researching the underlying business prospects of low-grade issuers in order to counteract investor reluctance and risk aversion. Milken argued that a diversified junk bond portfolio offered better returns and higher liquidity and convinced investors to invest. The junk bond market was largely unregulated, with secondary offerings not required to be registered with the SEC and no listed prices, which provided opportunities for Drexel to earn substantial fees, sometimes as high as 30%. Early clients of Milken included wealthy Jewish financiers in the insurance industry, who were pariahs on Wall Street and attracted by Milken's innovative ideas. Despite their troubled past, including SEC scrutiny and lack of formal education, Milken gladly worked with them. Drexel Begins Issuance of Junk Bonds Milken came across a company named Texas International, who was in need of capital but too highly leveraged for a traditional bond rating company to rate their debt. Milken proposed issuing the debt themselves and directly marketing it to the public, resulting in a successful sale of a $30 million junk bond and a 3% underwriting fee for Drexel. By taking this bold step of issuing their own bonds, Milken would begin expanding the size of the junk bond market beyond all expectations. The Formation of Wall Street's Most Infamous Duo Among Milken's controversial business partners over the years was Ivan Bosky, an arbitrageur with aspirations of becoming the next Rothschild. Milken's relationship with Bosky began in 1981 
when Boski was seeking out an investment banker to finance his new venture into leveraged buyouts, which were the hottest trend on Wall Street at this time. Milken agreed to finance him and lent him $100 million with a 17% interest rate. This was the beginning of one of the most infamous duos in the history of finance. One of the great things about this nation is that we can seek profit, and I'm proud of that. Drexel Storms, the corporate takeover scene. The 80s was a boom for mergers and acquisitions, dominated by big corporations with financial power. Milken aimed to enter the market but faced difficulties attracting these big companies. He decided to focus on smaller firms with limited options. Hostile takeovers, a tactic used by corporate raiders to acquire undervalued firms for profit, was controversial. Big investment banks such as Goldman Sachs shunned hostile takeovers due to negative publicity. Milken announced Drexel's entry into hostile takeovers at their 1985 bond conference, attended by Wall Street leaders. He marketed it as a game changer empowering smaller players to target big corporations. Soon after the conference, some of the top names in corporate rating would embark on acquiring large corporations with Drexel's financing. T. Boone Pickens launched a bid to take over United Oil. Nelson Peltz made a bid for National Can. And William Farley initiated a bid for Northwest Industries. Posner's hostile takeover with Milken and Boski. In the early 1980s, Victor Posner, a notorious corporate raider with a reputation for his proclivity for young women, approached Milken and Drexel for assistance in taking over Fishbach, a company in which he held a 5% stake, but was prevented from acquiring more due to a standstill agreement. To circumvent this, Milken enlisted the help of his friend Boski to purchase enough Fishbach stock to trigger the end of the standstill agreement, with a false disclosure statement concealing Milken's involvement. This marked the beginning of Milken and Boski's sequence of illegal financial conspiracies. In 1985, Posner raised $56 million through high-yield bonds, underwritten by Milken, which he used to acquire Fishbach and appoint himself as chairman. Once in this role, Posner pursued self-enrichment, diverted assets, and downsized the workforce. Milken bankrolls financial titan Henry Kravis. In 1985, Milken funded KKR's takeover of Storer Communication, but was barred from buying stock in the company. Milken had Boski secretly buy shares, then sell them for a profit of $1 million after the buyout price was made public. This was a small fraction of the $49 million Drexel earned from financing the deal, but highlights Milken's drive to maximize profits even through insider trading. Milken would again finance KKR, this time in their hostile takeover of the company Beatrice a major American food processing company. Milken obtained warrants to attract bond buyers to the deal, but instead kept them for himself in a private partnership. The warrants, bought at 25 cents per share, gave Milken the right to 22% of Beatrice, valued at $26 per share, a total of $650 million. The Beatrice deal proved to be the most profitable in Michael Milken's career, thanks to these warrants. However, it was not the largest dollar value deal that Milken financed for KKR. That came later in 1989, when Drexel secured $5 billion to fund KKR's acquisition of RJR Nabisco, the maker of iconic food brands like Oreos and Ritz crackers. The total acquisition cost was a staggering $24.8 billion, and Drexel raked in over $250 million in fees for financing the deal. KKR's leveraged buyout of RJR Nabisco was the largest acquisition ever in corporate America during that time. Milken makes history with record-breaking compensation. In 1986, under Drexel's favorable compensation formula, Milken's department was paid $700 million in compensation. Milken gave $150 million to his workers and kept the $550 million for himself. In that same year, just one of Milken's 500 secretive ventures generated $400 million for him. Moreover, his Beatrice warrants increased in value to an astonishing $650 million during this year. Milken was likely one of the top 10 richest men in America at this time. Despite his substantial earnings, Milken quarreled with Drexel's CEO for hours over not receiving a measly $15,000 finder's fee, which displays his intense determination to squeeze every penny from his deals. 
The Downfall of Ivan Boski Dennis Levine, an investment banker under SEC investigation, started cooperating with the agency and disclosed that Ivan Boski was providing him with insider information in exchange for payment. As a result, Ivan Boski was subpoenaed by the SEC. Boski got together with his lawyers and went over the wide array of financial crimes he was involved in with Milken, including insider trading, 13D violations, parking violations, and a large conspiracy affecting the control of corporations. Boski's lawyers suggested he try to cut a deal with the government. Boski agreed to cooperate and give the government inside details into the financial crimes he committed with Milken. The Downfall of Milken March 1989 saw Milken's indictment on 98 charges of racketeering and fraud by a federal grand jury. On April 24, 1990, Michael Milken admitted guilt to six charges of securities and tax infringements. By pleading guilty, Milken committed to a $200 million fine and a settlement with the SEC, in which he would repay investors who were affected by his actions with $400 million. On November 21st, 1990, Michael Milken returned to the courthouse where he had previously pled guilty. The judge announced his sentence of a 10-year prison term. After the sentence was given, Milken was taken to a nearby room. Suddenly, he let out a loud scream and collapsed into a chair. He was hyperventilating and struggling for breath, causing someone to shout for oxygen as a federal marshal quickly sought assistance. Milken comes out on top. Milken's punishment was eventually lessened, resulting in a prison term of only 22 months. He retained the majority of his earnings from Drexel and emerged from prison as a billionaire. In 2020, President Trump granted a full pardon to Michael Milken. Mike Milken, who's gone around and done an incredible job for the world with all of his research on cancer, and he's done this and he suffered greatly. He paid a big price. Paid a very tough price, but he's done an incredible job, and uh, yeah. Currently, Milken has a net worth of $6 billion and is involved in the issuance of SPAC IPOs. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to learn more about the story of Milken and Boski, check out the book Den of Thieves, which is also available on audiobook. The link to this is in the description below, and I will earn a small commission. Check out my last video covering the history of Countrywide, the largest subprime lender during the 2008 financial crisis, and its founder, Angelo Mozillo. In many ways, Angelo Mozillo, he's like one of those cartoon characters, the evil genius cartoon character who wants to dominate the world.